Medistand. Understanding Medicine. I am Professor Azizur Rahman, and we have already covered mitral stenosis, and this time we are going to cover this another condition related to mitral valve disease. It's mitral regurgitation. Uh, since many of the concepts related to hemodynamics and uh, the pathogenesis of rheumatic heart disease, though they were covered in detail in my first lecture on mitral stenosis, so I will not be uh, discussing them here to save time. So it is recommended that you first watch that video on mitral stenosis and then you attend this one for a better understanding. Now this is the cartoon uh, which just shows uh, an arrow uh, indicating the blood going back from the left ventricle to the left atrium. In a normal heart, in a normal cardiac cycle, blood never goes back from left ventricle to the left atrium. If that happens, that would of course happen during systole, that would be called regurgitation. That means blood is going back into the, regurgitates back into the left atrium. It is also called mitral incompetence. That means white mitral valve doesn't close properly. And the etiology uh, could be uh, any of these, but most likely, at least in our part of the world, would be rheumatic. Uh, patient with rheumatic heart disease, they most commonly, uh, they, it affects mitral valve and mitral valve may get stenosis or regurgitation, usually combined, but it could be predominant regurgitation or predominant stenosis. But there may be ischemic cause of mitral regurgitation because mitral valves are supported by cordy and papillary muscles. Now, in ischemic heart disease, in cases of infarction, there may be involvement of papillary muscles so they do not provide required support during systole and the mitral valve might actually prolapse into the left atrium and cause regurgitation. Degenerative is a condition uh, where uh, I'm not sure if this word is correctly used here. It is actually a congenital disease related to connective tissue uh, where the cordy are unduly long. They are redundant. So uh, in a normal a person when left ventricle contracts, papillary muscle also contracts, and then the during uh, during um, uh, systole, the mitral valve cusp they stop in the neutral position. But if the cordy are redundant, then they might prolapse into the left atrium, uh, and that cause uh, in incompetence or regurgitation. Then functional mean mitral valve is structurally normal, but if left ventricle dilates, like it can happen in dilated cardiomyopathy, then that could result in regurgitation, and we call it functional because mitral valve is structurally normal only because of some dilatation of left ventricle there is regurgitation. Uh, then in infective, of course, infective endocarditis is a relatively common condition and we are going to discuss that also in a separate lecture. In infective endocarditis, there may be damage to the mitral valve and there may be regurgitation. So there are a number of possibilities, a number of etiologies of mitral regurgitation, but by default it would be rheumatic, uh, uh, rheumatic etiology. Pathophysiology, this was also discussed in detail in mitral stenosis, but I think I'm going to repeat it here. Uh, because of the mitral regurgitation, blood is going back from the left ventricle to the left atrium. So left atrium is subjected to left ventricular pressure, which is very high as compared to left atrial pressure. That would lead to left atrial enlargement. Left atrial enlargement in mitral regurgitation is usually more pronounced than you get in mitral stenosis because in this case, uh, with every systole, the systolic pressure, the left ventricular pressure actually dilates left atrium. And this would also cause left ventricular volume overload.
I like to explain this in some more detail because this will be really helpful to understand some of the clinical features. What is volume overload? When a chamber, when a ventricle, either left or right, when a ventricle receives more blood during diastole, that means when there is more venous filling, that would cause volume overload. Now, how do we get volume overload in mitral regurgitation? Uh, uh, during diastole, left ventricle will receive blood from the pulmonary circulation as per normal case, but it would also receive the blood which had gone back during the previous systole. So, left ventricular filling is more than normal. This would cause dilatation of left ventricle and it would also cause hypertrophy of left ventricle. Now, this pressure in the left atrium uh, will be transmitted backward into the pulmonary veins and pulmonary capillaries and this will cause pulmonary venous hypertension. And this is actually a passive phenomenon. If we correct mitral regurgitation, this venous hypertension will be uh, normalized. And it would also cause left ventricular hypertrophy because left ventricle is getting more venous turn. As per Starling law, if a ventricle receives more blood, more venous turn, it will contract with greater force, it will produce greater stroke volume, and that would lead to left ventricular hypertrophy and left ventricular dilatation. That would translate into certain clinical features like displacement of apex B and some ECG changes. Uh, the same pressure, uh, pulmonary capillaries can sustain only a certain level of pressure if that pressure, if the pressure in the pulmonary capillaries exceed that critical level, that will lead to pulmonary edema. Uh, because blood will, uh, the fluid uh, of the blood will ooze out into the interstitium and alveoli. This would cause pulmonary edema. Of course, pulmonary edema would cause dyspnea, it would cause certain clinical features like basal crepitations, tachypnea, and this would indicate a serious condition. When there is left ventricular dilatation and hypertrophy, left ventricle might actually fail. The left ventricular hypertrophy uh, might be followed by left ventricular failure and that would have its own clinical features. This pressure, then the pulmonary venous pressure through the pulmonary capillaries is transmitted back into the right side and there is pulmonary arterial hypertension that would cause right ventricular hypertrophy and then right ventricular failure. You already have left ventricular failure. When right ventricular failure is added, it will be truly a biventricular failure or congestive cardiac failure. And then it would be called, uh, thus the CCF is congestive cardiac failure. Now, this is the natural history of uh, mitral regurgitation. Now, if you remember the mitral stenosis, patients with mitral stenosis, typically they go into pulmonary edema, they go to the hospital and then they are relieved by medication. Then they remain symptom free for a long time and then again go into pulmonary edema. So, typically patients with mitral stenosis will have this history of recurrent phases of uh, pulmonary edema or dyspnea. Whereas in mitral regurgitation, because left ventricle can take a lot of extra load, so left ventricle takes that extra load by sympathetic um, uh, stimulation, by hypertrophy, by increased contractility, and patient will remain asymptomatic. Patient may just have little palpitation but no dyspnea. But once left ventricle fails, that means all the compensatory mechanisms have exhausted, then patient will go a very, very rapid downhill. Even if at this stage, if left ventricle has failed, even if mitral valve is replaced, the prognosis will be very poor. So we need to take an early action. Like in mitral uh, stenosis, these factors, I'm not going to discuss them in detail here. If there is reduction in cardiac output, there is a possibility of atrial fibrillation, there is a possibility of thromboembolic phenomenon, there is a possibility of in infective endocarditis. All these are complications of uh, rheumatic uh, valvular disease. So any of them can certainly deteriorate the condition and patient may become very, very symptomatic.
So if you have understood this one, then the rest of the things are very easy. Uh, the symptoms same as mitral stenosis, dyspnea, which is progressive initially on exertion, then on minimum exertion, then at rest, and patient may become orthopnic. Patient may not be able to lie flat or patient may, may not be able to sleep because of the pulmonary edema. And as, as I said earlier, initially well tolerated, but then once patient becomes symptomatic, there is rapid downhill. Uh, so these are the symptoms. You can't really make a definitive diagnosis of uh, mitral regurgitation on history. You can of course suspect, and when you examine the patient, then you should be able to make a diagnosis. Uh, physical signs, there is heaving and displaced apex bead. Heaving means when you put your hand on the precordium, you will have the feeling as if your heart is lifted off the precordium with every display. This is because of increased stroke volume. And displaced apex bead, apex bead is displaced typically leftward and downward, laterally and downward because left ventricular dilatation so that is one feature this will in fact uh, differentiate mitral stenosis from mitral regurgitation in mitral stenosis we do not get displacement of apex bead and the type of apex bead you get in mitral stenosis is tapping so here it is heaving and apex bead is displayed leftward and downward then first sound may become soft the first sound is produced by the closure of mitral valve. Uh, although it is an oversimplification, but it is easy to memorize because in mitral regurgitation, since left, this is mitral valve doesn't close, so there won't be a uh, first sound. So I think if you want to believe in that, so you can, uh, that will be useful to memorize the thing that first sound is soft in mitral regurgitation. This is very, very important, the very typical, very characteristic murmur of mitral regurgitation. It is pan-systolic, that means it is heard throughout the systole of the same intensity. It is soft and blowing, that is the character. Soft and blowing murmur can be very easily appreciated and what exactly it means, uh, you will be only able to learn when you auscultate number of patients with mitral regurgitation. It is best heard on the mitral area and do note that mitral area would be displaced in this patient and it radiates to the axilla and the left axilla obviously and it is best heard with the diaphragm. So if you uh, have auscultated few patients with mitral regurgitation then you cannot miss this uh, murmur. Typical pan systolic murmur which is soft in and blowing in character, best heard on the mitral area with the diaphragm of the stethoscope and it radiates to the left axilla. Now this is the graphic representation if this is a normal cardiac cycle, first sound, second sound, systole and the diastole uh, followed by another cardiac cycle. This is uh, the, uh, you see this uh, bar, this, this uh, I have drawn shorter than this one uh, signifying that the first sound will be soft. Now this is pan systolic murmur. It starts with the first sound and ends with the second sound. Sometimes it becomes actually harder to appreciate first and the second sound separate than murmur. So it's a pan systolic murmur and see the same height of all these lines indicate that the murmur intensity is the same throughout. Uh, this is unlike ejection murmur, which we will discuss in the next lecture. So, soft first sound and a pan systolic murmur. And this may be a little taller, indicating pulmonary hypertension. So, this is the uh, graphic representation of murmur of mitral regurgitation. Diagnosis, uh, same, uh, all components as we discussed in uh, mitral stenosis. I have highlighted clinical and echocardiography. All are important 
but I think in 80-90% of the cases, you should be able to make a proper diagnosis of mitral regurgitation after careful uh, auscultation. And but you should always go for an echo because echo will give you very very detailed information that is required to optimize the treatment of this patient. Uh, on XHS, uh, this is of course a very very advanced case. What you see is massive cardiomegaly. There is a way of measuring that I have discussed in my series on X-rays. Uh, but here also you can even without measuring tell, you can tell that the heart is very very big. But there is a way of measuring. You draw a line, a horizontal line from the inner part of the chest cage from one side to the other side. This represents the maximum internal thoracic diameter. Now, if you draw another line, the most convex part of the heart on both sides, this is the maximum transverse diameter of the heart. Normally, this should be less than uh, the maximum internal th th thoracic diameter. So, this line should end somewhere here. This means there is massive cardiomegaly which can occur due to left ventricular dilatation. In mitral regurgitation, there may be right ventricular dilatation. I suspect in this case, there is biventricular dilatation. That is why you have this big cardiomegaly. Of course, there are other causes of cardiomegaly, but this uh, we are discussing mitral regurgitation. You will get this kind of thing in mitral regurgitation also. Uh, echocardiography is a great tool. Uh, we have M mode echocardiography, we have 2D, two dimensional echocardiography, and we also have a Doppler examination. Now, this picture shows you the Doppler. Uh, these colors they are actually coded. I mean, a blue color indicates that the blood is flowing in this direction. When we do echo, we put a transducer. This is the left ventricle. Transducer would be somewhere here uh, on the apex of the left ventricle. So since blood is flowing away from the transducer, it would call, make a blue jet. Now this is of course computerized, uh, computer generated, but this actually indicates that the blood is flowing from the left ventricle into the left atrium. And uh, you can actually measure the amount of blood going back. Now this is red because there is perhaps some aortic regurgitation also because if the transducer is here and the, this aortic regurgitation would mean that the blood is coming toward the transducer that is not we are not discussing that at the moment just notice this blue jet indicating that the blood is regurgitating back from the mitral valve into the left atrium so this would be confirmatory on echo if there is any complication of mitral regurgitation like a clot in the left atrium or left ventricle or if there is vegetation or if there is additional valvular disease like in this case aortic valve disease and the exact amount of blood uh, regurgitating back would be calculated so echo provides a great tool and lot of information and accordingly you plan the treatment the management uh, initially uh, sometime patient may be diagnosed before he or she develops symptoms uh, on routine examination if you hear that murmur then you may just like to observe this patient and may not uh, give any medication or treatment if you do need to give medical treatment it would be diuretics because patient would have pulmonary edema diuretics typically loop diuretic furosemide uh, and sometimes digoxin if patient has uh, atrial fibrillation. So combination of diuretic and digoxin might help, but this of course is only a palliative treatment. The definitive treatment would be surgery, and in surgery we either try to repair the valve or we try to replace the valve, depending upon how bad the valve is. Uh, of course, repair would be cheaper uh, option. Uh, most surgeons would try to repair the mitral valve uh, unless it is not repairable, in that case, a prosthetic valve would be needed. Now, uh, I again mentioned in the, my early lecture that it is often uh, the situation that patient has mitral stenosis and mitral regurgitation combined. Since rheumatic process actually damages the valve, 
once the valve is damaged, it might end up having both regurgitation as well as stenosis. Now, in that case, there will be a combination of physical findings. Both murmurs are heard on mitral area. This is the pan systolic murmur of mitral regurgitation. This is the mid diastolic murmur with pre systolic accentuation. This murmur is that of mitral stenosis. So you have both murmurs, both are best heard on the mitral area, but mid diastolic murmur does not radiate to the axilla, whereas pan systolic murmur would radiate to the axilla. So if you have two murmurs, one in systole, one in diastole, both with different characters, this is soft and blowing, this is rough and rumbling, and this one would uh, systolic and radiate to the axilla. This is the diastolic murmur and would not be radiating anywhere. So you can make a diagnosis of combined mitral valve disease. Uh, this is another type of uh, mitral valve prolapse. I would cover this condition in just one slide. A common condition uh, typically seen in young, skinny, tall girls. In this case, what the problem is these cordy, you know, these papillary muscles and these cordy, these cordies are redundant. So when left ventral contracts, the cusp does not stop in this neutral line, the blue, the black line. It actually regurgitates back into the left atrium, causing some uh, some regurgitation. Okay, so this is what this condition is, and cordy are redundant and prolapse into left atrium. Murmur is preceded by a click, because when left ventricle contracts, the cusp they move backward, and when they stop. Uh, they have prolapsed into the left atrium and when they stop they create a sound called click that is followed by a murmur and treatment in this condition is usually conservative because more, most cases are mild cases they have very mild symptoms just a little bit of palpitation they do not have frank left ventricular failure of course occasional cases may be uh, having symptoms uh, Theoretically, anything which reduces left ventricular size may increase symptoms and signs, like for example, dehydration, use of diuretics. Anything which increases left ventricular size, like full hydration or maybe beta blockers, uh, that really helps. So, we give those drugs which increase left ventricular size. If left ventricular size increases, then of course the redundance of these cordy will be reduced. So mostly treatment is conservative. Thank you. This was um, uh, our main account of mitral regurgitation. But I'm going to continue with the quiz also because uh, I think it is only 22 minutes video. Let's complete a uh, quiz of mitral regurgitation. And this is a kind of revision what we just discussed. A young girl presents with palpitation and atypical chest pain. Past history is unremarkable. Physical examination is normal except a pan systolic murmur on the mitral area. ECG and XHS are normal. So what does the murmur indicate? It indicates mitral regurgitation. What investigation will be diagnostic? In all congenital and rheumatic heart diseases, the diagnostic investigation is echocardiography. What would it indicate if the intensity of the murmur increases on standing? Now, this is the murmur. This feature indicates that this is actually mitral valve prolapse, not rheumatic mitral regurgitation. Because when you stand up, immediately blood goes to the legs, less there is a, uh, the venous return is reduced. Once venous return to the right heart is reduced, same venous turn is going to go to the left side and the venous turn to the left heart will also be reduced and left ventricular size will become smaller, slightly smaller and slight reduction in left ventricular size will increase the intensity of the month. How will you treat this patient? Reassurance and with uh, some fluid and I think only really you would need to repair 
the redundant coordinates. Next question. Which one of the following is not a feature of mitral regurgitation? Okay, you have to pick up one. Ejection click. Soft first heart sound. Loud, loud P2 component of the second sound. The pulmonary component of the second sound. Displaced apex beat and systolic ejection murmur which in your opinion is not the feature of mitral regurgitation this one is correct answer ejection click we get in uh, mitral valve prolapse soft first heart sound because mitral valve doesn't close properly the sound is the first comp first heart sound is produced by the closure of uh, mitral valve so that is why this would be soft pulmonary component of the second sound may be loud because of pulmonary hypertension apex beat is typically displaced to the left and downward because of the dilatation left ventricle but systolic ejection murmur is not the feature of mitral regurgitation this murmur you get in aortic stenosis or pulmonary stenosis so this is the correct answer Question number three now, which one of the following reliably differentiates mitral stenosis from mitral regurgitation? Many of the symptoms, many of the clinical features, radiological features are same. So there is one clue uh, which can differentiate one from the other. Right ventricular hypertrophy, pulmonary hypertension, atrial fibrillation, left ventricular hypertrophy and p mitral which one of the five can help you to differentiate mitral stenosis from mitral regurgitation the correct answer is left ventricular hypertrophy because only in mitral regurgitation you get left ventricular hypertrophy in mitral stenosis, there is no left ventricular hypertrophy. In mitral stenosis, in fact, the left ventricle does not get even its normal uh, share of work because there isn't enough venous return to the left ventricle. So there is no reason for left ventricle to, hy to hypertrophy in pure mitral stenosis. So if you have left ventricular hypertrophy, that will help you to differentiate mitral stenosis from mitral regurgitation. Question number four, which one of the following procedures is not indicated in mitral regurgitation? Mitral commissurotomy, repair of valve, replacement of valve, repair of cordy tendony, repair of papillary muscle. This should be easy. I think the answer is mitral commissurotomy because Commissurotomy means that the valve is stenosis, you just open it up with balloon. Uh, in this case, the valve is not stenosis, valve is actually incompetent and you would need uh, one or more of this. Uh, let's now go to the, I think the last question. No, that is that was the last. Thank you very much. This was Professor Aziz Rahman from uh, Medical Stand and we have already covered mitral stenosis and uh, next lecture will be on aortic valve disease we are uh, having lectures on different valvular diseases valvular heart diseases and next one will be on aortic valve disease thank you very much and i really look forward to see you in my next lecture thank you for joining